camels store water in their hump? Or that bats are blind? And crocodiles' tears are for real? Well, you're in for a big surprise as we count down the top 10 most extreme animal myths to discover which popular fact is the biggest load of fiction. Find out if you really can teach an old dog new tricks when animal myths are taken to the most extreme. Earth is a planet of extremes. Extreme places and extreme animals. But some animals are more extreme than others. Join us as we count down to find the most unusual, the most extraordinary, the most extreme. We've always had a healthy appetite for tall tales, even if sometimes they are a little hard to swallow. And when people don't let facts get in the way of a good story, an old wives' tale is born. <laughs> Although not all myths are based on idle gossip, we're counting down to find the urban legend that should be taken with the biggest grain of salt. And we begin with the outlandish story of a jumbo-sized memory. How would you like to be able to recite a list of 32 numbers after hearing them just once? It's no problem for 13-year-old mathematical prodigy Tuma Kranti Kiran. And just for fun, he can repeat them again, backwards. No wonder people say he has a memory like an elephant. So is it true? Does an elephant really have an amazing memory? To find out, we need to discover what goes on inside that massive head. Not surprisingly, the elephant has the biggest brain of any land mammal. They have about the same number of brain cells as humans, but they're not as densely packed. So in some ways, we really could have a memory like an elephant. People say that elephants never forget, and it's kind of true. Their lives depend upon their remarkable ability to store and retrieve vital information about their world. The matriarch of the herd carries a mental map of a home range that can extend over an area the size of Rhode Island. The elephant's survival depends on her ability to remember the location of every feeding ground and watering hole. Elephants can also remember and identify the noises made by at least 100 other adult females. Each unique call allows the herd to stay in contact when visually separated in dense forest and means they can identify elephants from outside their family network. The social system of elephants is incredibly complex. They must be able to remember their place in a hierarchy that radiates out from families to the clan and on to include independent males and other populations. One researcher has witnessed a mother and daughter obviously remembering each other after being separated for 23 years. Elephants are not born with all this knowledge. It's acquired over many years of watching and learning from the rest of the herd. So, for the first contender in our countdown of extreme animal myths, we can safely say that it's true. Elephants do have phenomenally good memories.
However, as the countdown continues, we'll discover that the tall tales get increasingly twisted. When it comes to crying, some people really go to town. But not all tears mean that people are genuinely upset. Sometimes they can be faking it. I just can't understand. It's not possible. If you're just pretending to be sad, you're said to be crying crocodile tears. So is it true? Are crocodiles really crybabies? The belief that crocodiles produce fake tears as they consume their victims has been around for centuries. But do remorseful reptiles really exist? Or are their tears a real croc? To find out, you need to take a close look at what happens when a croc goes hunting. It seems that crocodile tears are more about greed than grief. Crocodiles can't chew. They have to rip their food into chunks and swallow it whole. The glands that keep their eyes moist are close to their throats. So the effort of swallowing forces tears into their eyes. Just like humans, tears keep the eyes lubricated and free from bacteria. But it's a reflex not remorse. So it seems that the tears of a crocodile are real. But what about the tears of a statue? Do you believe in modern day miracles? Sometimes religious icons and statues can appear to weep. Could these tears be a sign that something miraculous is taking place? Or is it condensation caused by changes in humidity and temperature? For the faithful, there's no doubt that these are definitely not crocodile tears. Crocodiles are number nine in the countdown because the myth about them crying is true, partly. They do shed tears, but not of emotion. After all, they really are just cold-blooded killers. It seems that the myths about our first two contenders had some basis in fact. But as our countdown continues, the truth gets twisted at a tea party where not everybody is mad. And what myth has sent one creature completely over the edge? To find the next contender in our countdown of extreme animal myths, we need to take a trip 
through the looking glass. Oh! Alice met all kinds of crazy creatures in Wonderland, but the maddest of them all had four legs and very long ears. And the frog, and Humpty Dumpty, and the mock turtle, and the march hare, and everybody else. Regardless of their mental state, you won't find many hares at tea parties. They're normally shy, solitary creatures. So why do people think that March hares are mad? The belief that European hares go a little crazy during the month of March has been with us for centuries. And it's easy to see why. Because at the start of spring, their behavior changes. Instead of being quiet and shy, hares appear to go a little nuts. A surge in hormones means that males go mad trying to find as many mates as possible. And then, the boxing matches begin. For a long time, this was thought to be just males fighting, but recently, Researchers discovered that it's the female that's hitting the male. She's either not ready to mate or is testing his determination. So the mad behavior actually makes perfect sense. She's just trying to find the best father for her babies. Strangely enough, there's another myth about reproductive success that also makes perfect sense. Have you heard what happens to the human population nine months after a major blackout? The story began on the night the lights went out in New York. One moment New York was glittering Gotham, the great white way ablaze. The next moment only flickering candles, automobile headlights and bobbing flashlights were probing a Stygian darkness. On November 9, 1965, New York City came to a standstill for ten long hours. And then, nine months later, stories began to circulate of a dramatic increase in the number of births. So is it true that when the lights went out, New Yorkers created a little baby boom? Sadly, no. A comprehensive study in the 70s revealed that the blackout caused absolutely no increase in birth rates. But even today, nine months after blackouts and blizzards, you can still find reports of a baby boom circulating in the media. It seems that the story of humans breeding like rabbits has even less basis in fact than the myth at number eight in the countdown. After all, it's only partially true that March hares are occasionally mad. If you were surrounded by testosterone-fueled males, you'd probably be a little crazy too. So far, we've seen that the myths in the countdown are not completely bogus. But will this change when we go knocking on the door of the world's sleepiest meteorologist? And is it true that a bug can crawl into your ear and eat your brain? There's only one reason people go knocking on the door of Mr. Groundhog. On February the 2nd, everybody wants to know if spring is really here. The story goes that if the groundhog doesn't see his shadow, he remains outside because spring has arrived early. But if his shadow appears, then he's scared straight back to the burrow for six more weeks of winter. So is there any truth to the groundhog's shadowy reputation? Can he really predict the weather?
To find out, take a trip to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. It's home to one of America's most famous rodents, a groundhog by the name of Punxsutawney Phil. He's the only mammal to have a day named in his honor, because this is no ordinary groundhog. Every year on the 2nd of February, Phil makes his famous annual weather prophecy at Gobbler's Knob. Phil whispers his weather prediction into the ear of his keepers. Bill Cooper, president of Puxatawney Groundhog Club Inner Circle, says the groundhog has an established track record as a furry barometer. Groundhog Day came to us through the European settlers that settled in this part of Pennsylvania. Folklore said if the hedgehog saw his shadow, we'd have six more weeks of winter weather. Well, when they came to America, we don't have hedgehogs, but we do have plentiful amount of groundhogs, and he became the marmot of choice to predict the arrival of spring. All marmots, including the groundhog, are big furry rodents, and they live in some of the most impressive alpine real estate in the world. However, the 14 different species found in the northern hemisphere don't have much time to kick back, relax, and admire the scenery. Every spring and summer, marmots take part in a race against time. They're eating for their lives, literally. Each day, a marmot can munch its way through an amount of food equivalent to one-third of its body weight. This gluttony is essential if it's to build enough bulk to survive the winter because it won't get to eat again till the following spring. By the time snow blankets the mountains, the marmots are already tucked up in the family burrow. They sleep away the winter by hibernating. Their temperature drops from 36 degrees to less than 4. Their heart rate falls from 250 beats per minute to just 10. And in deep hibernation, they'll only draw breath once every six minutes. And when it wakes up, do they really predict the weather? Well, they are responding to seasonal changes in light and temperature that give them a cue that spring has arrived. So it could be said that they are a kind of barometer. Well, what do you see here, big guy? What you feeling? So has reality been overshadowed by a myth? Does the groundhog predict spring, or just react to the change in seasons? Well, as far as the people of Puxatani are concerned, it doesn't really matter. They know Phil's a marmot, not a meteorologist. What we tell people is there are a lot of serious and important things in life, and Groundhog Day is not one of them. It's just serious fun. kinds of fun and games when we meet the sixth contender in our countdown of extreme animal myths. After all, pin the tail on the donkey is easy until you become as blind as a small nocturnal flying mammal. So is it true? Are bats really blind? In the past, people thought that bats must have great eyesight to be able to see in the dark. Certainly researchers have had no trouble proving that somehow bats can negotiate an obstacle course. So what happened when they blindfolded the bat? Thank you.
Obviously, bats don't need their eyes to detect the world around them. Bats navigate by emitting high-intensity pulses of sound and listen to the echoes that bounce back from objects. Their sophisticated sonar can even detect things as small as a strand of spider silk. By painting pictures with sound, bats are far from blind. Yet, according to another myth, there's a different way to see in the dark. In World War II, Britain had developed a top-secret device that gave them early warnings of aerial attacks. Their radar stations could detect incoming planes, even on the darkest night. To keep the enemy guessing about the nature of their secret weapon, British intelligence created a rumor. The increase in the number of planes being shot down was because British pilots had enhanced their night vision by eating carrots. Even though there's very little evidence that eating carrots can dramatically improve your vision, they got such good publicity that soon everybody was crunching their way to better eyesight. The myth lives on today, as does the idea that bats must be blind since they navigate with sound, not their eyes. This, however, is false. Their eyes may often be small, but they're fully functional. And thanks to their sonar system, they don't need to eat carrots to improve their vision. Our last two contenders have shown that sometimes people never let facts get in the way of a good story. So does that mean that you really can't teach an old dog new tricks? And later, we'll discover if you need a pump to fill up a hump. A city the size of New York is home to any number of urban legends. But coming in at number five in our countdown of extreme myths is one of the shaggiest dog stories of them all. It's said that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And that's bad news for Jen Kushner and her canine companion, because Gypsy has issues. Gypsy's a wonderful dog. She's very social. She's very sweet very enthusiastic, perhaps a little too enthusiastic, and because of it, she likes to jump up. Oh no! So, Jen and Gypsy have called in the experts. Hey! Hey, Victoria! How you doing? Oh, Gypsy! Hey, Gypsy! What's up? I see she's still up to her old tricks yeah. here with the jumping. Meet animal behavior counselor and star of Animal Precinct, Victoria Wells. She knows that to train a dog, you have to know how to communicate with them. And a handful of food doesn't go astray either. So here's some slimy hot dogs. Good! I know, I know! All right, Gypsy. All right, you ready? There's so many dogs in this city that jump up on people. And since it's so congested in New York City, you can't have them jumping all over the place. So that is the number one thing people come to me to, to fix. Hi, Victoria. Hey. How are you, Gypsy? Oh, Gypsy. Any behavior 
that you're training your dog to do. It doesn't happen overnight, you know. People want results quick, but it really takes practice every day for a little bit, just 15 minutes. It takes about two weeks for the behavior to become solid. See, that's what you want to see. Okay, sit. There you go. When it comes to teaching new tricks to old dogs, can make all the difference. Scientific studies have proved that a dog's ability to learn does decrease with age. However, new research has shown that a diet fortified by fruits, vegetables, and vitamins can help keep the brain in tip-top shape. It's believed that these foods, rich in antioxidants, reduce the aging effects of harmful free radicals in the brain of both dogs and humans. The belief that what you eat affects how you think is nothing new. Centuries ago, the Egyptians thought that fish was a brain food, and it turns out they were right on the money. Fish contains high levels of omega-3 fatty acids, which help build brain cells. A recent study in Chicago found that people over 65 who ate omega-3 rich fish at least twice a week were 60% less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And this is one dog that's been eating all the right brain food. Well, Jen, now that Gypsy is cured of all jumping issues, wouldn't it be fun to teach her to jump over appropriate things? Jump! Good girl! Jump! Good! Now she's getting into it, huh? Jump! <laughs> jump! Yeah! Just as people can change, dogs can change. So you can teach an old dog new tricks. Okay, so it's your turn, because I can do it, but it really has to be you doing it. Jump! <laughs> <laughs> so it seems that this myth is false, as long as you're prepared to put in some hard work and some good food. <laughs>
So what's the connection between chickens and human cue balls? Scientists have discovered that chickens still have all the genetic information they need to grow teeth. The gene has been inactive in birds for 70 million years, but recently researchers have managed to reactivate the DNA. They were able to grow chicken embryos with teeth. If scientists can identify and understand the gene that controls hen's teeth, then in theory it should be possible to reactivate similar genes in humans. Perhaps one day a drug will be developed to reactivate hair follicles. The estimated 40 million American men facing the future with shiny skulls. This could be hair raising news indeed. While we're still a long way off understanding the human genetic code, there's no doubt about the validity of the flights of fancy coming up in the countdown. <laughs> So far we've learnt the truth about toothy chicks and dogs learning tricks, but still to come, how do you explain people influencing machines using nothing but the power of their mind? And is it possible that some people could really have bugs on the brain? For the next contender in our countdown of extreme myths, the desert is the last place you want an empty hump. So is it true? Can camels really store water in their hump? It's a great story, but the reality is far stranger. It's true that even in a scorching desert, a camel can survive for up to seven days without drinking water. But that's not because it carries a reservoir on its back. The camel's hump is actually a giant mound of fat, often weighing up to 35 kilograms. Like most animals, humans store their fat mixed in with muscle tissue or in a layer just beneath the skin. Only camels pile some of it all together into one big lump. So while the hump doesn't store water, it does store food. By breaking down its massive fat reserve, the camel can get enough energy to survive for up to three weeks without eating. Unlike camels, most humans don't like having big lumps of fat on their bodies. The Battle of the Bulges. And here are some of the latest mechanized units on maneuvers, or rather, womanoeuvres. We've come up with all kinds of ways to lose lard and created a host of fantastic myths. One of the biggest is that exercise is a fabulous way to lose weight. Walking or running 1500 meters burns about 100 calories. Sit in a chair for the same time and you'd burn about 60 calories. But that doesn't mean dieters should give up on exercise. If you run 8000 meters instead of 1500, you'll burn 500 calories. What's more, when you're unfit, 
your body tends to burn mostly carbohydrates and not fat. When you're in good condition, your muscles adapt using an enzyme that oxidizes fat. When we exercise, the thing we lose the most of is actually sweat, unlike a camel. Thanks to a unique internal thermostat, a camel needs a body temperature of more than 40 degrees before it breaks into a sweat. And that's why the camel is number three in the countdown. It doesn't need to store water in its hump because it's found extreme ways to conserve its body fluids. It has super efficient kidneys that produce urine that's as thick as syrup. Its bowels extract so much water that you can use camel dung as fuel for a fire. But even with all these water conservation tricks, camels can still work up an extreme thirst. They can chug down about 100 liters in 10 minutes. Just don't go thinking that they store it in their home. got too many legs. They skitter. Perhaps that's why we've always been so willing to believe the very worst about a bug. Especially a bug that's said to crawl into your ear and eat your brain. Crawling in to number two in the countdown is a bug with a reputation that's truly terrifying. It's the earwig. It's said to be fatally attracted to our ears. Isn't that where an earwig likes to lay its eggs? Eggs that will eventually hatch into bugs that eat their way into our brain? To find out if it's true, we need to take a close look inside our head. It's no myth that the occasional insect could blunder into our ear hole. But a quick trip down the ear canal shows that it's impossible for an insect to eat into our head. Perhaps it could chew through the delicate eardrum. But not even the hungriest bug could reach the brain because it's protected by a very thick layer of bone. So how did earwigs get such a bad reputation? Especially since they prefer living in rotting vegetation, not human brains. The answer is largely thanks to their unfortunate name. The word earwig is thought to be a corruption of the Saxon word earwicka or ear insect. That's because a long time ago someone must have taken a close look at the insect's hind wings. Somebody must have made the connection that when you stretch out the wing membrane, it bears an uncanny resemblance to the human ear. It's amazing how quickly myths can become established as truth. However, there are some people with an insatiable appetite for separating fiction from fact. If the truth is out there, they'll find it at the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory. Is there any such thing as mind over matter? Can human consciousness influence machines? These are just some of the questions the lab has spent over a quarter of a century trying to answer. One experiment has volunteers testing the myth that they can influence a random number generator using nothing but the power of their minds. This machine is little more than an electronic coin flipper 
designed to come up with as many heads as tails. It sounds like something straight from a Star Wars movie, where Jedi Knights use the Force to move objects. Yet analysis of the results suggests that participants can mentally influence the random number generators. Similar experiments involve trying to influence the height of a water fountain and the direction in which a robot will travel. All these machines are programmed for random movement, but sit a warm body in front of them and they do seem to obligingly respond to the person's intentions. Laboratory manager Brenda Dunn says the results raise as many questions as answers. Uh, we're not seeing dramatic uh, monumental changes in, in the observable world, but we are seeing subtle changes which over long periods of time and over large databases compound to statistically very significant and highly unlikely uh, effects that uh, are, they're real. But how do you explain them? While the Princeton researchers are still puzzled by the results of their experiments, it's just as difficult to explain the earwig's bad reputation especially since the female is one of the best mothers in the bug world. She's one of the few insects that hang around to look after her babies. So, when it comes to having bugs on the brain, the earwig is completely innocent. But not even this caring mom can compete with the manufactured myth that's tainted the reputation of the animal that's number one in the countdown. We've seen the nine contenders. They've all been victims of outrageous gossip and innuendo. Only one animal's reputation has been more maligned. To uncover the most extreme animal myth, to the Arctic tundra. This is home to the most maligned creature in the countdown. It's the lemming. For years, people have believed that swarms of these small rodents commit a spectacular form of mass suicide. This strange instinct defies all logic. Like people crowded in cities, the lack of privacy seems to drive them to aggression. Suddenly they can't stand their neighbors, and in an effort to get away from it all, they begin to run anywhere, as long as it's someplace else. And for many, it leads to disaster. But do hordes of lemmings really throw themselves off a cliff to drown in the sea? Or is this the greatest man-made myth ever? It is true that every three or four years, in some regions, localized populations of lemmings will drop almost to extinction and then just as quickly rocket back up again. Nobody knows for sure what causes these surges, but when a colony starts to become overcrowded, lemmings hit the road. These mass migrations spawn the myth, because in peak years, thousands of lemmings do spread out to find new territories. But they're running to get away from intense competition, not to self-destruct. Each lemming needs nearly one hectare of 
and they won't find it by jumping off a cliff into the sea. So where did the myth come from? We have to travel back to the 1950s, where a film crew was making a documentary on lemmings in Alberta, Canada. They filmed a migration sequence by placing lemmings on a snow-covered turntable. Then, to add a little drama, they went outside and herded the lemmings towards a cliff by a river. The good news is that contrary to popular opinion, lemmings don't really throw themselves off cliffs. Thanks to the filmmakers confusing mass migration for mass suicide, lemmings got stuck with reputations as mindless automatons with a death wish. But nothing could be further from the truth. It's not the lemmings that go over the top. It's humans that are willing to believe any tale, no matter how far-fetched. That's why, when it comes to animal myths, the lemming really is the most extreme.